Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Harris, uh, who's going to be talking to us today about how to think about Virginia Woolf um, through the context of, of three of her books, uh, which would be fantastic for just here. And I think uh, some of the points about the text and the context and literature, literary practices, and literary artifacts will also be of great interest across the board. So, Oh, thank so, you, Michael. Um, thanks to both Michael and Andrew for setting all this up and inviting me to do it. Um, I was a little bit scared by the the how to uh, the how to question. Um, how to think about Virginia Woolf definitely has a, a question mark on the end of it for me. You know, this is not going to be how we must think about Virginia Woolf. Uh, she herself wrote a, a great essay called How Should One Read a Book? Question mark. Um, so this is all sort of experiments. Um, and I'm going to start with a, a methodological point about how to um, deliver this talk about methodologies, because um, Wolf herself was extremely sceptical about anyone standing up and giving a lecture. Um, she was generally very interested in, in life, uh, not much bored Virginia Woolf, uh, until it came to someone standing up and talking at her. She just couldn't stand it. Um, and she writes a, a great essay in 1934 called Why? in which she describes the sheer awfulness of a typical lecture. Um, in walks a harried looking man. Uh, there was a momentary stir. He had written a book, and for a moment it is interesting to look at people who have written books. Sadly, then this man starts to talk, and she goes on <laughs> and on. Uh, the face of the clock seemed abnormally pale, the hands suffered from some infirmity. Had they gouped? Were they swollen? They moved so slowly. Skip, we entreated him. Just skip. And Wolf concludes by saying, why, since life holds only so many hours, why would we waste one of them on being lectured? Um, so I'm in a, a tricky <laughs> position. We'll put the clock away, if it won't tyrannise us. And I'll put a nicer kind of Bloomsbury scene up. Uh, this is what Wolf preferred. Uh, people sitting around and talking in, in deck chairs, uh, thinking together, correcting each other, no hierarchy. Um, so that's my ideal model, except I am going to talk at you for a bit. Um, and then we can have a conversation. Um, I feel like I don't have any sort of summarisable and abstractable methods. I feel like I'm just going to talk through how it's been for me with, with Virginia Woolf, to be honest, and we'll see if we can abstract some methods from it. Um, she's, she's been um, the sort of big inspiration for me um, since I started being at all interested in reading, really, which was late, like about 16, I realised I liked reading. Um, so I, I read to the lighthouse first at, at 16, and, and it had a quite sort of physical effect on me, and I, I didn't really know why. Um, I'm not sure I even understood the book. Um, but at uh, that stage, I was thinking of doing, you know, I was thinking of doing physics A level, um, <laughs> you know. But to the lighthouse was the was the one, and I think for most, I guess most people in most subjects have their conversion moment. And I've always sort of wanted to know more about people's conversion moments and how and how they endure and how their relationship with that thing that initially triggered the passion has has changed. So. For me, it was a, a moment on a green sofa reading to the lighthouse. Um, and it all went downhill after that, really, because uh, I'd already chosen to do maths A-level. And what I did was to, to, to do a statistics project in which I counted the average number of semicolons uh, in Virginia Woolf as opposed to the average number of semicolons in George Eliot. Um, and I made graphs of every kind about these two things. Um, so, I, you know, I was, I was quite obsessed. Uh, and, and the obsession got into as many bits of my life as I could welcome it into. Um, and so I'm actually not going to deal with my first book first. I'm going to deal with this little biography I've, I've written um, because it will allow me to introduce key facts about it a bit more easily. Um, but I was asked to write this book. I was asked to write a, a short sort of introductory biography of, of Wolf, and having given you that background of my general obsession, it was almost impossible to decline uh, an invitation to write a short book about Wolf. Um, 
primarily, I suppose, because I knew that I, would, I wouldn't be able to write a big biography of Wolf, because the big biography of Wolf uh, was written by my great hero and supervisor, Hermione Lee, and I wasn't going to go anywhere near that kind of thing. And that's another thing that's a bit taboo and that we don't talk about, is you know, the things that we uh, you know, step around and try to avoid because of other people and all of that. So there was a lot of sort of personal entanglement behind being asked to do this, uh, and it worried me. The small space worried me um, because we've got a huge, great life here. Uh, so, you know, a lot of novels, a lot of letters. It's a tremendously documented life and a tremendously interpreted life. I mean, uh, I, don't, I haven't counted the number of books published on Virginia Woolf, but it's, uh, I think about 300 new books on Virginia Woolf each year. Um, and there's certainly already about 20 biographies. Uh, so the sheer audacity and pomposity of putting another one out there uh, was something that was, was rankling. Um, also, Virginia Woolf herself was so interested in how we write lives. And so you can't, you can't write a, a naive biography of, of Woolf. You have to do it self, with self-consciousness about the way that you're constructing a, a life story. Um, Wolf writes very explicitly about the possibilities for uh, uh, fragmenting the structure of biography. Could, could we have a biography which just takes sample days, she says. Um, a lot of this thinking comes when she's asked to write a biography of her friend Roger Fry, um, and so she's really sort of put to the test of how one might write a life story. Um, and she thinks, well, perhaps, since I don't know everything about him, perhaps I will dole out particular areas of his life to the friends who knew that bit of him best. Basically, you get a collection of essays. Um, none of those things are, in the end, what she did. Um, and a lot of people read her biography of Roger Fry and think, oh, she did a pretty much cradle-to-grave uh, life story. Um, but she'd gone through a hell of a lot of thinking and experimenting on the way to ending up with actually quite a conventional book. Um, in a way, of course, it's her fiction which prompts the most radical thinking about how we should uh, convey life stories. Um, I always had in my mind particularly um, the scenes from Orlando, her novel about a, um, which is really a biography, she publishes Orlando as a biography. Um, Orlando, her life story of a man who changes into a woman and lives for 500 years. Um, and we've got a narrator who's struggling to tell her, her life story and who gets into particular trouble when Orlando just sits and writes her poem. And of course Orlando is just sitting there at the desk. And our poor narrator, straight biographer, is thinking, heck, would she just do something? You know, what am I meant to write now? Um, and so we've clearly got this problem of, of how you write in a lives, if you're dealing with a writer who outwardly is spending most of their time sitting still, you've got a problem. Um, and our uh, narrator, straight biographer, goes into ecstasies when Orlando finally gets up to spot a fly. Here is action, here is blood, she says, great. Um, so clearly it's a great exaggeration and parody of the problem, but Wolf has pose all of these difficulties in advance and so one has to be rather conscious about what one's doing. Um, I've got another uh, little moment from Orlando here which is uh, one I always use with the undergraduates and I uh, kept having it in mind when I was writing about Wolf um, because she's so interested in the different selves that make up our individual beings. Um, the fact that in any one moment we can choose to be many people that we have uh, at our fingertips a great many personas. <laughs> um, a common enough idea for anyone interested in modernism, modernist literature or psychology all told. But Wolf, I think, puts it terribly well. Here's Orlando. If there are, at a venture, 76 different times all ticking in the mind at once, how many different people are there not, heaven help us, all having lodgment at one time or another in the human spirit. Some say 2,052. These selves of, of which we have built up, one on top of the other, as plates are piled on a waiter's hand, 
these selves have attachments elsewhere so that one will only come if it is raining, another will only come if it's in a room with green curtains, and some are too wildly ridiculous to be mentioned in print at all. Orlando in this scene ends up simply having to call to the self that she wants, the appropriate sort of self, Orlando! And we've all felt that as a party, where your party self just refuses to come out and play. Um, and so I think as soon as you, you look at any one image of Wolf, when you're conscious of all kinds of conflicting messages and versions of, of self, um, this is one that scares me, actually. Wolf in Vogue, 1924. First of all, she's in Vogue. Here's an icon, stylish, friends with the editor of Vogue, Dorothy Todd is ordered, uh, offering to take her shopping. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a chic, modern version of Wolf, or is it? She doesn't look like it. Um, there she is, wearing her mother's dress. It doesn't fit. It looks scary. You know, this is a woman who is haunted. Uh, by her uh, maternal inheritance particularly. She's yet to write to the lighthouse, the book in which she talks about having exorcised the ghost of her, her mother. Um, so this putting on of the mother's dress, whose idea was that? Um, is she posing there uh, obediently because she's been placed there by the photographer? Or is this a kind of willing conspiracy in this strange game of marrying up modern fashion and a Victorian inheritance that doesn't fit. Um, and there again, she's staring off into the distance, as she often is in her photographs, uh, looking like the ethereal, dreamlike writer she was often thought to be uh, in the 50s and 60s when everyone wrote about her as terribly abstract and forever about to have some kind of fit of genius. Um, and, and that melancholy that comes through um, from her, the portraits of, of her mother as well. Um, all of that crowding strangely together uh, and put in the middle of Vogue. Um, so I was aware that for any one week in Wolf's Life, uh, there are these different version stories, inheritances coming to the top, that reading any one day, the letters she writes might say completely different things to the diary that she's writing. Um, and it will be different again uh, in the memoir club papers she gives uh, and in her autobiography. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples of where she sort of mythologizes her past, makes, makes things up, smooths things over. Um, no, that's not. Um, 1904, can we go back a bit? 1904 um, was a sort of key Bloomsbury moment. Uh, Wolf's father died, uh, and she and her sister moved to Bloomsbury for the first time. This is the beginning of, of Bloomsbury, 1904. Um, and for the rest of her life, Wolf would totally mythologize uh, the great move from a uh, tight, dark, Victorian, patriarchal household into a uh, big, bright Bloomsbury Square, big windows, uh, autonomy, people talking late into the night. Uh, when she gives the memoir papers and um, this club of friends who would all reminisce together and would give sort of sparkling performances of each other's pasts. Uh, she talks about that moment saying everything was going to be new, everything was going to be different, everything was on trial. Um, and so she writes and rewrites that moment as a sort of radical, brave, courageous break with the past. Then you read her journals from that year and you realise that she didn't move into the new house at the same time as everyone else at all. She was in the middle of having a breakdown after the death of her father. Um, and when she did eventually get to the house, she hated it. Uh, she was missing Kensington. She would walk all the way across London to get back to Kensington. Um, she walked around Regent's Park thinking that it just wasn't as, as, as good as Kensington Gardens. Um, right, all her writing um, has, has a sort of deep undertow of her father's uh, voice in it. 
Um, so one very explicit instance of a time which was uh, traumatic and uh, full of disjunctions for her, um, but which she later improves to give to give the right sort of shape to her life because she wanted it to be progressive, she wanted it to be uh, radical and experimental and to be there at the forefront making the change. Both those versions are, are simultaneously true and, and important. Um, and I'll just uh, give one other um, of these, these altered moments which interested me, um, which concerns the, the great date, the magical date of 1910. Um, I thought about 1910 quite a lot in 2010, when the Modernist Studies Conference was called, you know, 1910, 2010, and we all had to go along with our uh, papers on, on 1910. Because um, it, it, Wolf said, and one of her most famous statements in her essay, Character and Fiction, is that on or about December 1910, human character changed. Um, and she, she gives these images of, um, of, of cooks who have been uh, uh, locked away in the leviathans of the kitchen, uh, suddenly coming up into the light air of the drawing room and borrowing one's copy of the women's magazines. Um, she gives these images of, of, a new, of new methods of writing coming into play from 1910, of new free ways of thinking coming into play. Uh, at this conference, everyone was saying, gosh, this is the move from Edwardian to Georgian. Gosh, this is the moment of the suffrage bill, you've got Black Friday in November and then the suffrage. Um, most of all, 1910 launches Bloomsbury on the world with the post-impressionist exhibition. Um, mounted by Wolf's friend Roger Fry, all of London uh, shrieking and apparently fainting, if we were to believe what Fry says, at the sight of Cezanne's, new, uh, Cezanne's landscapes and Matisse's nudes. Um, modern French art in the middle of the capital, everything changes. Wolf's sisters talking about a sizzle of excitement and art quake. Okay, right. So I went along to this conference and I thought, I what Wolf was doing in 1910. <laughs> um, turns out, she had an absolutely dreadful year. Um, she was trying to write her novel, The Voyage Out. Um, she'd been trying to write this novel now for the past five years, and she'd been writing it for another five years yet, so she wasn't getting anywhere fast with it. Um, and she was pretty desperate about it. Um, she was, in fact, uh, Beginning by the beginning of 1910, she's starting to show um, the symptoms of, of, of depression, of, of nervousness and agitation that suggested all was, was not well. Um, by February, the doctors are advising her that she shouldn't stay in London. Um, and she's sent away. Um, she's sent on this series of trips through Cornwall and um, uh, in the hope that she would have these sort of self-imposed rest cures. Um, and it seems to me such a striking fact that this moment that gets written up by Wolf, by her friends and contemporaries, and by you know, later commentators as the central London revolution, Wolf's not there at all. She's been really ill down in Cornwall. Um, she's under orders not to get excited in this year of excitement. Um, in June, her sister, Vanessa, went, went to house in Canterbury and sort of you know, goes there to, to look after her, um, hoping that there's going to be a recovery. No recovery, um, and Wolf's taken into um, a, a rest home at, at, in Twickenham, um, given one of Dr. Savage's, not least, I didn't kill her, but um, you know, pretty uh, uh, tyrannical rest cures, uh, where she's force fed. Um, and uh, kept in confinement for a long period of time, can't write, not allowed to see people. Um, and her, she's allowed just a, a few letters now and again, um, in one of which she, she sounds so stoically accepting, and she just says, Savage says he won't insist on complete isolation, so I suppose I shan't be so badly off as I was before. That's it. That's, that's one of only, I think, about, about 10 letters from that, uh, from three months in, in Twickenham. Um, no emotion in it, 
just a sort of stoic, perhaps, perhaps I'll get out of here eventually. So it's bad. 1910 is really bad. Um, she spends it, this fabled year, in a darkened room without people, listening to terrified cries of um, sort of suffering inmates who are also in this mental hospital. Um, and she's not allowed to read. She's certainly not allowed to write. Um, so it becomes vital to her later on, uh, when she's healthy again, when she's putting her life together, it becomes vital to make sense of, of that time. And she writes herself out of it and insists on, on entering imaginatively into that year and its successes and its excitements. Um, she talks about that year opening up a form of modern fiction that will be all about opening windows, letting the drafts in, letting life in. And that's how she remakes a year which she spent um, very much annexed from life. Um, so just those few tiny little case study moments will say will show you how difficult it is to get the balance, I suppose, between um, writing uh, what it seems like at the time and including the later versions of it. Um, and one mustn't, of course, trust even the diaries. Although, uh, of course, the diaries tell a sort of truth, but Wolf is always making herself up in the diaries. Um, there were five published volumes of the diaries. She kept them um, for most of her adult life. Um, but she, she, said, she says at one point, very tellingly, um, she's just improved a party scene. She went to a party which she was a little bit bored by and she felt that she hadn't been witty enough. And she, she says, but I won't write this out. I want to appear a success even to myself. Um, so she's constantly writing for herself as an older woman. She envisages herself as 55, reading back these diaries and wanting to be completely overwhelmed by how brilliant she was. Um, so the diaries are edited. They're at the same time extremely intimate, extremely candid, but also fictions. Right here. That was my bit on cells. Um, my next, my next little bit about what I struggled with in this, in this book, what I enjoyed thinking through, um, was to do with finding room uh, for routine daily working life and ordinary things. Um, and I thought this was particularly difficult with Wolf because you say her name and immediately you get a, a series of big sensational questions. People ask you about her illness, uh, about her suicide, about her lesbianism, uh, about, uh, what else do they ask you? Uh, of course, about 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 what about the way Leonard treated her and her illness. You know, you get the pro Leonard and the anti Leonard, Leonard activists and the female. Um, but it's, you know, she does she, she does not come to you fresh. She comes with all these big questions that you know people are going to ask and which you need to address. Oh, of course, the child. I forgot the child. Um, so you've got to have an answer. You've got to give a version of all of those big issues. Um, and this must be the, the case with, I think it's quite, quite exaggerated in Wolf, but whoever one writes about biographically, you can immediately sense the big issues. And that made me think, oh wait, but what about all the things that are not the big issue? I sort of want to deal with those as well. Um, and this became, this became quite a, um, a, a, a challenge for me, actually. I wanted to give this version of of Wolf as a, as a worker, um, just going through her daily life, doing her work. Um, and so I wanted to include these images, like I had taken my friends. Um, she was always spurring herself on in the most physical possible ways. Um, and though we see her as very ethereal, um, she would talk about uh, her year in terms of laps. She thought she was running laps as she was uh, you know, working her way through the, the year. Um, intellectual problems she often talks about as these fences. And so she gets to the end of The Waves, which is about the most abstract book you can get, her eyeless novel. And she's thinking about herself as a jockey. She says, yes, I've taken my fence. 
Um, so there's that that constant kind of undertow of the uh, um, of the of the physical the physicality of her intellectual life at the same time as her being this sort of romantic genius who walks around Tavistock Square and suddenly sees how the book ought to be. Um, so I wanted that sense of I wanted a sense of daily doggedness to be in there. Amongst all the sensational stuff, I wanted the idea of this woman who always chose to stand at her desk. You know, she always wrote standing up because she thought that, made it, that, that had more of a sense of, of action, practicality. Um, uh, of the routine. Wolf loved a good routine. Um, her favourite days were where she could perfectly go through from her 10 to 1 working and then have her walk uh, and then have someone to tea that she could talk to her about in a, in a meeting uh, and then do her reading for the next day's writing and, and her most perfect day of 1922 uh, which she calls like a perfect piece of cabinet making was just one of those ordinary days where she wrote, went for a walk and read things. Um, and it seemed to me just as important as a biographer to get the feel of those days the, as to get the feel of um, the days leading up to her death or um, the day when she finishes to the lighthouse. Um, joy in ordinary things. That links in with this pleasure in, pleasure in routine. Um, I wrote an article about her. Um, when I was asked to sort of market this book, I did a, a big article, article headed, I am the happiest woman in SW1, which is just a kind of throwaway comment she makes in 1931. And I thought that's the side of Wolf that people don't quite know. Um, because we find it quite difficult, I think, to tell stories about happiness. Happiness doesn't quite sell in the same way as, uh, as, as abuse and suicide. Um, but but I thought it was really important to hear her being really happy on the bus or opening her letters. Um, and she says here, simply because we had hot rolls for breakfast. Um, and it's just the sort of thing that becomes sort of luminously satisfying in her fiction. Uh, a character will suddenly feel replete and satisfied because breakfast has gone well. Um, Wolf was really interested in those daily, ordinary things that suddenly take on significance. And I thought, I Johnny Welsh should be too. Um, so in between the big questions, I just tried to find room to hear her say, I like driving off to Rodmel, that's her Sussex house, on a hot Friday afternoon and having cold ham and sitting on my terrace and smoking a cigar with an owl or two. Um, and I wanted too to give a few examples of Average days. That was one of the, the techniques Wolf suggested for writing a biography, is just dipping in here and there to an average day. Um, and it doesn't quite work to write a book like that because, of course, no day is summative. Um, no day is average. Um, but this was just a, a little extract from her diary in, in 1935. Uh, and a lot of her diary is, is like this. And it gives you that sense of just this busyness of, of her world. Um, you know, seen all these people, been to a concert, uh, saw Morgan, that's A.M. Forster, uh, asked to speak at some lunch, gosh, there's another one, read all early Roger's letters, noted them, she's writing the, her biography of Roger Fry, uh, also Keats, also manuscripts, uh, she's reading uh, two or three manuscripts a day for the Hogarth Press. And you know, it just gives you that sense of the fullness, that overwhelming sense that this every day is like this. Every day is packed with these odd bits and pieces. N not 1% of that is going to get into a biography, but you've somehow got to give a sense that it's there underneath that fullness of the life. And that particular day counted to Wolf as a day of calm, complete bliss. This is how she wanted to be. Um, uh, this reminded me of the great biographer of Roy Foster, who started his biography of uh, Yeats with a consideration of how far we should think about the, the daily events of people's lives and how far we're trying to trace out the big narrative arcs. Um, 
and and he made what has become quite a, a sort of seminal statement. He said, "We do not, alas, live our lives in themes, but day by day." Um, he was responding there to the fact that Yeats wrote his own autobiography as a series of themes, uh, remaking his own life in terms of its narrative arcs and, and mythologies. Um, Foster chose instead to really go chronologically, to give us all of that kind of detail. To be honest, it's quite challenging to read because you're so overwhelmed with the stuff, you don't know how it all links together, because it's not your life. Um, so getting the balance between theme and stuff, you know? Mm. Uh, really important and really hard. Um, and this brings me to another big question. Uh, a question any literary critic, presumably uh, lots of people in other subjects, are challenged by is how far do we structure our thinking chronologically around uh, a, a, a logical read through. Um, I decided that I wanted just to read more chronologically, read it through. So I had these two absolutely blissful winters um, of you know closing the curtains like the fire and and I and I went through it from, from birth to death. Um, and and with her it means that on any one day she's going to have produced a diary entry, some letters, uh, she's going to have you're going to be able to get at the bits of draft, you'll know what she was you know adding to, to the lighthouse that day. Uh, there's probably a bit of an essay that she wrote just in a, you know some little moment after lunch and cast off her amazing seductive essay about Chaucer or something. Um, and I mean, I rapidly became aware that she was able to write much more in a day than I could read in a day, so I got behind. Um, but I wanted that sort of immersive sense of her life unfolding and really got it. Um, when you read chronologically, you notice precisely the point at which some kind of motif or image emerges, and you can see very clearly it's uh, revision and unravelling. Uh, across a, a lifetime, and to me that was one of the, the great joys. Um, you know, you, you look at the, her writing about the folding doors at Hyde Park Gate, uh, where these big family rooms could be divided up with folding doors, and you realise that all the way through her fiction there were these images of, of folding doors, putting up barriers, uh, where, a room, where the atmosphere of a room spills over into another. You can just see it, you can see it forming. Um, you know, I was uh, aware of her responding to her, her father called uh, Carlisle a, a steam train and then immediately picks it up as a young woman and starts calling herself a steam train and then all the way through you get more steam trains. So there's that basic sense of making it easier to follow through those motifs. Um, there are other things. Um, when, you're, when you're reading chronologically, nothing is inevitable because you're so in the moment. Um, and, and I think it's really salutary because Wolf clearly didn't know what was going to happen the next day. And you can, for a moment when you're reading chronologically, pretend that you don't either. Um, simulating that sense of an unfolding life felt to me a quite necessary uh, imaginative experiment. Um, I think, yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so I put it up, that's amazing. When you're immersed in it, nothing feels in it. Um, yeah, Hermione Lee does this great um, sort of critique of, of the film of the hours, which is one of the great you know, biographical responses to, to Wolf's life. Um, and what Hermione felt really troubled by was the fact that the hours start with her death. You have Nicole Kidman on that bright sunny day descending into the water. So that the whole of the film is predicated on the end of Wolf's life. It's all <coughs> trajectory towards a, a death. Um, and, you know, a, a sort of very powerful argument seems to be that that really affects our reading and it means that we can't actually read that life in terms of life, we have to read it in terms of the death that it precedes. Um, and my main um, sort of instance of that question of inevitability came when I was reading um, Through the Diaries for 1935 when Wolfe was writing her novel The Years, and The Years turned out to be a novel which caused her a breakdown 
Um, it's her least read novel, and all sorts of people talk about it as a failure. She very nearly burnt it. Um, and so the main critical response to it is trying to work out why it went wrong. And what completely shocked me reading the diaries was to realise how, how right it went to start off with. So she gets to the whole first draft, finishes the book, and says, the main feeling about this book is vitality, fruitfulness, energy, full stop, great, go to a party. Actually, they go to Brighton to buy sweets. Um, and it's only in the final stages of this book that it goes wrong, that it becomes a nightmare. So knowing that, Having kind of taught myself out of the, uh, the readings of an inevitable end, I sort of went back to the years and I thought most of this was written on a complete high. She enjoyed writing this book more than any other book she'd ever written. And it made me read the book differently. Um, there were all sorts of uh, fruitfulness, energies, that I hadn't seen there before. Um, and just one other little example of, of this, it's a, it's a very moving example really, is that we know that the war's going to come and we know that Virginia Woolf is going to die in 1941. But if you forget that and you're reading about them on a bus in 1938 and Virginia is asking Leonard, what should we do for the next 10 years? And they make the plan for their life in their 50s. You think, my God, you know. They were planning on the long scale at that point. There was absolutely no uh, inevitability about her dying at all. Um, so that's all on the side of chronology. Um, just a few little problems about it. It's just sort of what we're doing. I'm not going for my three books at all. I'm just going to jump straight to the weather at the end. Um, clearly, Life and art don't always match up temporarily, temporally. Um, so I was, you know, if only I could have had uh, the years uh, 1915 to 1922, and you get all the big themes from the life, and then you get the novel which she's writing at that time. But it doesn't make any sense, because the novel that she's writing in those years might be to do with 20 years before that. Um, so during World War One, she's writing Night and Day, which has probably has a sort of East War engaged novel. Her war energies come afterwards, so you have to bring uh, you have to bring the ideas of the war novel back into her experience of the war. Um, and the bit I really struggled with was um, while she's having this, she's you know, terribly excited about her being in love with the Vitas at the West, um, and she goes on to write a book about that love affair, which is. Orlando, but she doesn't write Orlando until she's finished having the love affair. Um, while she's having the love affair, she's writing to the lighthouse, which is about something completely different. It's about uh, her childhood, her parents, it takes us into a different world entirely. So how you structure that is a complete nightmare. Um, and I ended up having uh, the love affair, then a completely separate chapter onto the lighthouse, and then going back to the love affair and having a chapter on Orlando, which was messy. And I wish I'd done it somehow differently. Um, but there's a methodological problem. Um, OK, I'm just going to finish with Wolf now. I knew I talked about for too long. Um, with another one of these uh, photographs that teases us. Um, this is from the other end of her life, 1939, June 1939. And again, she looks as if she's you know, calmly thinking through her novel from the White Wolf. Um, but on this day, you realise, reading her diaries, uh, Wolf was not really happy to be sitting there looking like she had all the time in the world to wait and receive the information of the God she didn't believe in. You know, she was actually that day trying to sell her flat because there'd been too much noise from the hotel over the road. Uh, so she's really cross. They tried to raise a lawsuit about the hotel, but it wasn't working, so they had to move. So she's showing new tenants around the flat. Uh, that was a bother. She's having to deal with her mother-in-law. That's more of a bother. Uh, she's making a date to see T.S. Eliot, uh, and she's worrying about the chapter on post-impressionism that she's trying to write for her biography of Roger Fry. And so she got really cross about having to sit down for that picture. And I think when we read these images of writers, one's always aware in the background uh, of that hum of life going on, of all that busyness and richness that is hard to see 
in those very focused, very dreamlike eyes. Okay, um, this is a sort of, a, 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 I didn't realise I had so much to say about that book, sorry. Um, I'm going to I'm going to skip to my weather book now, um, and I can always talk about romantic models afterwards. Um, okay, this too, bizarrely enough, was inspired by Julia Wolf. Um, Wolf in Orlando um, suggests that you can write history through uh, the different weathers that are, appear. So. You may know the, the film for Orlando uh, with Tilda Swinton as Orlando. Where this is the Renaissance, which is uh, set in the Great Frost. Wolf has a sense that Renaissance weather is extreme, that it's either extremely frosty or extremely sunny. There are no slow mists or fogs. Everything is sharp and distinct and dramatic and definite. Uh, whereas, of course, in the Victorian period, it's all dark cloud and rain and blur and mist and we're not quite sure about anything and, uh, and the rain causes people to have many babies and, and also to have many drawing rooms with many pianos. Um, now, it's all a joke of a sort, but it's Wolf had found in her reading um, clues towards this sort of shifting sensibility which uh, which makes her think that at particular times we've been acu acutely aware of certain kinds of weather that seems to sort of symbolise the way that we think our culture is working at that moment. Um, our British climate has not changed that much over time. People will harp on about the uh, Little Ice Age, um, but I think what's far more interesting is the way that our sort of sensibilities have been um, tuned into certain kinds of weather by our culture and our aesthetics. Um, so I wanted to do this big sort of panoramic read uh, that followed Orlando really through the centuries, um, which is completely mad, obviously. Um, but it's been it's been such a revelation to kind of read my way through Anglo-Saxon literature, which is mesmerised by ice and cold. Uh, go through Chaucer and the spring comes out. Um, you get to the Renaissance. There's, you read Decker as Wolf read Decker. Um, Thomas Decker's great descriptions of the frost, the spectacle of it, the drama, um, all a bit giz giddying actually. Uh, but but good to have Wolf actually as a guide. Um, and to me, Wolf seemed to be a guide to how to read as well as to the kind of project we might um, write. And I'm just going to finish with a few um, instances of how Wolf suggests we might read weather. Um, you can't just Google weather, you can't just Google rain in the ebook of, of Hardy and expect to get to all the good weather moments. Wolf shows us how to read for weather a little bit more subtly than that. Um, I enjoyed her review of uh, Roger Kipling's notebooks, um, where she gets a little bit tired of his uh, ways of writing about nature and, and weather. She says it's all just about word matching, uh, trying to find the right adjective for the, the moonlit sky or the, uh, the plane trees after rain. Wolf wanted to do something a bit less formulaic than that. Um, and she sets out in this Kipling essay um, a technique which she uses herself. Way to do it, she says. And she's talking about the way to evoke a particular kind of weather. Is that you set people talking in a room with their backs to the window. And then, as they talk about something else, let someone half turn her head and say, a fine evening when, if they've been talking about the right things, the summer evening is visible to anyone who reads the page and is forever remembered as of quite exceptional beauty. Wolf manages this precisely in uh, Between the Acts. She opens her novel uh, with people talking in a room with a window open to the summer evening outside. And you look closely and she really doesn't describe the summer evening outside at all. We pick it up from something about the tone of the conversation, the way people are in that, in that room. Um, and so she teaches us to read below the, the literal description of, of weather. And she teaches us too how weather influences our reading. 
Um, so in a very early essay on De Quincey, um, uh, what should you do? Um, she's thinking about um, the fact that De Quincey is best read out of doors. She says, take us out of doors, um, because uh, Quincy, she thinks, just doesn't keep with clock time. He needs space to expand because he takes so long to say anything. So she thinks he's better read outside. Um, and she makes her final summation of De Quincey's writing absolutely dependent on the circumstances in which she's read him, which I think is terribly interesting. And, and it's something that I think none of us would dare to do in a review. I wouldn't say, you know, my reading of this because it's entirely dependent on the fact that I read it on a train and this is what I thought about. <laughs> you know, we always think that we've got to be getting beyond that kind of subjective environmental response. And Walsh says that that's exactly what matters. The generous reader, she says, reading luxuriously in some sheltered garden where the view between hedges is of a vast plain and a sunk beneath an ocean of air, will find that a page of De Quincey is no mere sheet of bold signs but part of the pageant itself. It will carry on the air and the sky, and as words do, it will invest them with finer meaning. Amazingly, she's still a very young reviewer. She allows literature and environment atmosphere to dissolve into each other so that literature becomes weather, the weather becomes literature. Words will carry on the air and the sky. Um, so I think I might um, actually I'm going to end there. Having invoked very early on her essay, How Should One Read a Book? I'll end with the way that uh, Wolf has taught me to read a book. Thank you.